Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 19. In this part, I'm going to talk about Newton's Law of Gravitation. The year was 1665, the month was August, and England was besieged by bubonic plague. Isaac Newton, then a 23-year-old Cambridge University student, retired to the solitude of his family's farm in Lincolnshire until the plague subsided and the university reopened. Not given to inactivity, Newton composed 22 questions for himself ranging from geometric constructions to Galileo's new mechanics to Te Kepler's planetary laws. During the next 18 months, he immersed himself in the search for answers and along the way developed calculus, the laws of motion and the universal law of gravity. There's a myth that he was inspired by the fall of an apple to consider whether gravity was responsible for the motion of the moon. Newton never wrote about that day, but did reminisce about it to friends some 50 years later. Maybe it was just an analogy. The story of the falling apple reduces one of the greatest discoveries to a simple idea. Newton had been struggling to find an explanation for the basic rules of planetary motion, which had been laid down by Johannes Kepler half a century earlier. What he realized explained the motions of planets and the moon, as well as falling objects on Earth. The answer, if he could find it, would also have to resolve the riddle of why all bodies fall at the same rate, regardless of their mass. At first, Newton didn't name the force explicitly. He knew that something had to attract the moon if it was to remain in orbit. The law of inertia stated that the moon would want to travel in a straight line unless some force acted upon it. He coined the word centripetal force for any force which is directed inward toward the center of an object's motion. Centripetal, centripetal means center speaking. In the case of the moon, gravity is the centripetal force that holds it in orbit. Newton's big discovery unified the gravitational force with the force that kept the moon in its orbit around the Earth. He suggested they were the same force. He defined a force of gravity that explained falling objects near the surface of the Earth and orbiting planets like the moon. In his work on falling bodies, Galileo studied projectile motion. Newton realized that the moon is essentially a projectile. I use the term satellite to mean anything that orbits another body, hence the moon is a satellite of the Earth. Newton considered firing a ball out of a cannon from a high mountain. The graphic on the lower right is an illustration that is taken from his book Principia Mathematica. The animation I'm about to show you shows it even better. First, imagine you just drop a, a cannonball. Gravity pulls it downward. If the ball is fired from the cannon, it travels horizontally, but notice that the Earth's surface is curved and it lands a little bit lower than where it started. If I fire the cannonball with greater velocity, inertia keeps it moving horizontally. It still falls vertically, but is gradually making its way around the Earth to point C. The greater the initial speed, the further it goes around the Earth before it falls. In fact, point D never reaches the Earth. The ball goes back to where it started. The cannonball has gone orbital. If you keep adding velocity, the orbit gets circular. And if you add more velocity, the, or the orbit gets elliptical. Newton suggested that given enough initial velocity, a cannonball could orbit the Earth continuously. The moon, Newton realized, had just the right speed to orbit the Earth, always falling towards it, but never reaching it. Here I'll describe Newton's law of gravitation. If this is the Earth, and if this is the moon, then this is the distance r between their centers. Newton theorized that the force of gravity exerted by the Earth on the moon was proportional to the product of the mass of the Earth times the mass of the moon over the distance between them, r, squared. The little symbols next to the masses are meant to designate the Earth and the Moon. We can express force as a vector. In the case of the Moon, it experiences a force from the Earth. In the Earth-Moon system, the Earth here is thought of as the central body. The Earth is more than 81 times more massive than the Moon. That being said, Newton's third law states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If the Earth applies a force on the Moon, then the Moon must apply an equal and opposite force on the Earth. If F sub G is the force exerted by the Earth on the Moon, then minus F sub G would be the force exerted by the Moon on the Earth. 
The main point here is that Newton suggested that these forces were proportional to the product of the masses of the Earth and the Moon and inversely proportional to the distance between their centers. What causes gravity? Newton theorized that the mass of an object is what causes gravity. We actually don't know the actual cause of gravity. What we do know is that where there's mass, there's a gravitational field. Newton thought the gravitational force was proportional to the product of the masses divided by the distance between them squared. Notice that it's a function of the product of the masses. If I place a test mass of negligible mass in the proximity of the force, I can then quantify the gravitational force of the Earth in that location. Newton thought that where there's mass, there's gravity. That means that there's a gravitational field that surrounds the Earth. You could put a white test mass anywhere around the Earth and it would feel the force of Earth's gravity. Some say that mass creates gravity. That implies a causal relationship. I prefer to say that gravity occurs where there's mass. Where there's mass, gravity occurs, and likewise, where there's gravity, there must be mass. Gravity is thus a property of mass. One way to characterize forces is with field lines. This diagram depicts a force emanating from a point source. Near the center, the lines are close together, implying that if you put a test mass near the source, the force is stronger. If you put a test mass out here, the force is weaker, which is consistent with the lines being further apart. I'll rotate these field lines around so you can see what they look like in three dimensions. In a real gravitational field, they would tend to be static. They'd only change if the mass changes. The lines of force coming from the source do not interact with each other. In this model, the mass of the test mass is negligible compared to the central mass, Otherwise, the test mass would be generating their own gravitational forces. If you follow the field lines outward, you can see intuitively that the field density diminishes with distance. At infinity, the force spreads out over an infinite area. When I said the field density diminishes, that's in a local area. The net gravitational force is always still there. The net force doesn't diminish. It's the force in a local area that does. Here's the sphere surrounding the source of gravity. If you were to count the number of lines that intersect this sphere, they'd be the same as the number animating from the source. That's intuitive. Gravity is a conservative force. No force is lost and none is gained. The sum total of all the gravity that impinges on the sphere is the same as the sum total that emanated from the source. Here I have two spheres. The number of field lines that intersect the second sphere equals the number that intersect the first sphere. And that equals the number that emanated from the source. This has to be the case since all the lines extend out to infinity. As long as the surface encloses all the mass at the center, the total force can be accounted for. I can move the sphere off center. And while field lines are more dense on the left and less dense on the right, the total number of lines intersecting the sphere is the same as all the previous cases. As long as the sphere encloses the source of gravity, the number of field lines will be the same. The magenta shape doesn't have to be a sphere. Any closed surface would account for all the gravity as long as the source of gravity is within the shape. Imagine a large soap bubble in this kind of shape. If the source of gravity is inside, then you count all the lines that exit the surface and subtract the lines that re-enter the surface. If a line re-enters, it must exit again. So the net sum is equal to all the lines that are emanating from the source. In calculus, this is a closed surface integral. If A, the surface, is the surface, and if it encloses the source of gravity, then the integral is constant no matter what the shape. Newton proved that you can consider the source of gravity as a point mass. In reality, there's no such thing as a point mass. A point mass is a simplifying assumption. Consider an apple of mass m falling toward the Earth. The gravitational force is what causes the apple to fall. Here's a bit of apple, and here's a bit of Earth. If gravity is a property of matter, then this bit of Earth would create a gravitational force on this bit of apple. According to Newton, the force between the two bits would be proportional to the product of their masses divided by the distance between their centers squared. Here's another bit of apple and another bit of earth. This bit of earth also creates 
a force that acts on this bit of apple. And here's that force. In fact, the first bit of earth creates a force on the second bit of apple and vice versa. To simplify this, I'll use the superposition principle that I talked about in the last part. I'll vectorally add all the forces between each bit of earth and each bit of apple. Let's say this is the earth and this is the moon. Newton with his integral calculus proved that a spherically symmetric object can be thought of as a point mass with all its mass concentrated at its center. That's why we measure the distance between the centers, not between the edges. The gravitational force originates effectively between the center point, or most, more specifically, from the center of gravity or the center of mass. This simplification makes the math much simpler. In the next part, I'll show you a proof for Newton's use of point masses. In part nine, I talked about Kepler's second law, and I showed you how to estimate the areas of slices of an ellipse by using circular wedges as an approximation. Kepler's second law states that an orbiting satellite sweeps out equal areas in equal time. So delta A, shown here, is constant. If delta A is constant for each wedge, the angle theta must vary. For the ellipse on the right, R, the distance from the focus to the point on the ellipse also varies. When I showed you this, I pointed out that the change in angle is proportional to 1 over r squared. The change in angle characterizes the timing of the satellite in orbit. 1 over r squared is known as an inverse square. So the timing fundamentally is a function somehow of 1 over r squared. Newton theorized that if the timing of the orbit is proportional to 1 over r squared, then the force 2 must be proportional to 1 over r squared. I'm going to prove this to you mathematically in a later part when I talk about the Kepler problem. In that part, I'll show you how Newton, with his gravitational equation and with his calculus, was able to derive Kepler's laws. Here's how the inverse square law works. Imagine blowing up a balloon. As the balloon gets bigger and bigger, the surface gets thinner and thinner. At some point, the balloon pops. The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. The latex in the balloon is constant. As the volume gets bigger and bigger, the area of the balloon gets bigger, which means the latex must get thinner and thinner. Here's a way to look at that. This is a cross section of the surface of a sphere. At a radius of r, the cross section is one unit square. The area of the total sphere is four pi r squared. At a radius of two r, the total area of the sphere would be four pi times two r squared, or four pi times four r squared. The projection of the one unit square at r would thus be four unit squares. If you double the radius, the cross section increases by the square of the radius. And since two squared is four, it's equal to four unit squares. At a radius of three r, the area of the sphere is four pi three r squared, or four pi times nine r. The projection of the one unit square cross section at the radius r is now nine unit squares because three squared is nine. If this were a balloon, then the amount of latex in the first unit square is the same as the amount of latex in the four unit squares at 2r, which is the same as the amount of latex in the nine unit squares at 3r. Hence, you have the same amount of latex spread over a larger area. If you look closely at this, this is a unit square, and this is a unit square, and this is a unit square. At r, the unit square has one unit of latex. At 2r, the unit square would have one-fourth the amount of latex. At 3r, a uh, unit square would have one-ninth the amount of latex. The walls of the balloon get thinner as the volume of the sphere increases. And it works the same way with gravity as you get farther away from the source. The term isotropic means uniform in all directions. Think of it as a sphere that constantly expands, like in this animation. A phenomena is isotropic if it starts at a hypothetical point and extends out like an expanding sphere. The Earth is nearly spherical. Its gravitational field is created by the mass of the Earth. And Newton suggested the, the force emanated out in all directions as if it came from a point source. Gravity would thus be isotropic. That's a term you should be familiar with. The inverse square law states that a specified physical quantity or intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source of that physical quantity. Since the surface area of a sphere is proportional to 1 over r squared, an isotropic gravitational field 
would also be proportional to 1 over r squared. I want to be clear here. The total amount of gravity at a given distance is constant. Remember that if you enclose the source of gravity with any surface, you can account for all the gravity no matter how far away the surface is. Gravity is a conservative force, meaning once you have it, you never lose it. The balloon's a good analogy. As the walls get thinner, the total amount of latex is constant. Same amount of latex, but thinner walls as the balloon gets better, bigger. It's the same with gravity. The larger area, however, means that a constant amount of gravity now encompasses a larger area. The number of lines that impinge on each of the blue unit squares on the right diminishes as you move outward away from the source. If this were gravity, the total amount of gravity at each square diminishes by 1 over r squared. The red lines in the diagram are like field lines in that they diverge as they propagate out spherically. The more dense, they're more dense near the source and more spread out further away. That's another way to depict the 1 over r squared phenomenon. This was an important element of Newton's law of universal gravitation. By the way, the effects of electromagnetic energy, light, sound, and radiation phenomena also follow a 1 over r squared law. The law of gravitation didn't necessarily start with Newton. It was suggested in 1645 by Ismael Palladius, but Palladius did not accept Kepler's second and third laws, nor did he appreciate Christian Huygens' solution for circular motion. Indeed, Palladius maintained the sun's force was attractive at aphelion and repulsive at perihelion. Robert Hooke and Giovanni Alfonso Borelli both expanded on gravitation in 1666 as an attractive force. Hooke gave a lecture in 1670 that explained that gravitation applied to all celestial bodies and added the principles that the gravitation power decreases with the distance and that in the absence of any such power, bodies move in straight lines. By 1679, Hooke thought gravitation had inverse square dependence and communicated this in a letter to Isaac Newton. Newton recalled discussing the idea with Sir Christopher Wren prior to Hooke's letter. Hooke remained bitter about Newton claiming the invention of this principle, even though Newton's Principia acknowledged that Hooke, along with Wren and Halley, had separately appreciated the inverse square law in the solar system. Newton famously said, I stand on the shoulders of giants. In this regard, Newton's discoveries were more of a compilation than fundamental work from scratch. I want to go back to Newton's equation expressed as a proportionality. I'm now ready to show you how Newton took this from a proportionality and made this into an equation. I'll put a mass here called m1 and another here called m2. Here's the distance between the centers. Mathematically, we think of them as point masses, so the larger circles are there just so they're more visible. I'll call the distance between the two center points R. I'm going to start with a force exerted by mass 1 and mass 2. Once I have that, the equal and opposite force is easy. Newton asserted that the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses divided by R squared. In the last part, I showed you that the unit of force is the Newton, which equates to a kilogram meter per second squared. That results from the equation F equals ma. The right-hand side of Newton's equation is mass times mass over distance squared. The units for that are kilograms squared over meters squared. In order for the units to work out, there must be something, the question mark, times kilograms squared over meters squared that equals kilogram meters per second squared. I can take a kilogram unit away from both sides. I can then multiply both sides by meters squared. Then I can divide both sides by kilograms. The units for this question mark have to be meters cubed divided by kilograms times seconds squared. Here I'll substitute that in the equation above. Now the units match. Here I'm just reversing the equation so it's the units of force which equals the new quantity times mass squared over meters squared. These are the units of force. And this is the proportionality equation. In order, to make, in order to make the units work out, Newton added a constant g with units of meters cubed over kilograms seconds squared. Force F, mass M1 and M2, and distance R all represent physical quantities. g in units of meters cubed over kilograms seconds squared. g is in units of meters cubed over kilogram seconds squared. Here's the value for g. It's called the gravitational constant. 
it doesn't really represent any physical quantity. It's simply there so the gravitational equation equates force with the product of masses over the distance squared. Of all the physical constants, G is the one that is known with the least accuracy. Other physical constants are the speed of light in a vacuum, electron mass, elementary charge, and Planck's constant. G is a constant of proportionality that equates force with the product of two masses over their relative distance squared. You might be asking why the need for this constant, and why are the units so strange? Well, it's because of the way the fundamental units were def defined. The unit of length, the meter, was defined to be one ten millionth of the distance from the Earth's equator to the North Pole, and was based on the length of a man's arm. It has since been defined to be the length of the path traveled by light in a vacuum over one divided by 299.792.458 of a second. In 300 BC, the Babylonians divided the day sexagesimally, that means by 60. That was further divided by 60 and so on to at least six decimal places. In the year 1000, a Persian scholar gave the times of new moons as the number of days, hours, minutes, seconds, thirds, and fours. In 1267, Roger Bacon did that for full moons. In Poland and Turkey, they still have thirds, which is 1 60th of a second. The rest of us subdivide seconds decimally by 10. It wasn't until 1670 that clocks were able to measure seconds with any accuracy, so they weren't in wide use then. In 1967, a second was defined as the duration of nine, 9,192,631,770 periods. I think I said that wrong, but you get the idea. Of radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. The kilogram is the mass of one liter of water at four degrees centigrade. Newton discovered a fundamental relationship between mass and the force of gravity. In his second law, Newton defined how a force affects a mass. Since he was doing that for the first time, Leonard Euler could simply state that force equals mass times acceleration, or F equals ma. The unit of force became the Newton in kilogram meters over second squared. And that equaled mass times acceleration squared, mass times acceleration, where the units are also kilogram meters over second squared. F equals ma thus needs no conversion constant. Even though Newton explained what he meant by mass, you can characterize mass as a quantity which is defined by F equals ma. If you know the mass of an object, you can determine its acceleration if you can determine the force that was imparted. Likewise, if you know the magnitude of the force acting on an object and the resulting acceleration, you can determine the mass. Newton and Euler's big breakthrough was equating force and mass. I mentioned any object that has mass will create a gravitational field. I don't know how I define the units, but for the law of gravitation, if I can redefine the kilogram as a measure of the gravitational field it creates, and the meter is an even multiple of the distance light travels in a second, and a second is an even multiple of how quickly light travels over a light second, then there'd probably be no need for a gravitational constant. Newton or Euler would have found a way to characterize mass, distance, and time in a way the, a unit of conversion would not be necessary. 6.693 times 10 to the minus 11th is a strange number with odd units in order to equate mass with force. Hence, this is not some mysterious constant that, that defines our universe. It's a constant proportionality because we chose a basis for the standard mass based on a kilogram of water, a second based on a human heartbeat, and a meter based on the average length of a man's arm. I want to talk about how the gravitational constant was originally derived. Henry Cavendish was a British natural philosopher, an experimental and theoretical chemist and physicist. He's noted for his discovery of hydrogen. His experiment to weigh the Earth has come to be known as a Cavendish experiment. And years later, physicists were able to use his results to calculate the gravitational constant G. He performed the Cavendish experiment in 1797 to 98. It was the first experiment to measure the force of gravity between masses in the laboratory, and the first to yield accurate values for the gravitational constant. The gravitational constant does not appear explicitly in his work. Instead, the result was originally expressed as the math, mass of the Earth. The experiment was devised sometime before 1783 by geologist John Mitchell. However, Mitchell died in 1793 without completing the work. After his death, the apparatus passed to Francis John Hyde Wollaston and then to Henry Cavendish, who rebuilt the apparatus but kept close to Mitchell's original plan.
Cavendish carried out a series of measurements with the apparatus. The apparatus was a torsion balance made of a six-foot wooden rod suspended with a wire with a two-inch diameter 1.61 pound or 0.73 kilogram lead sphere attached to each end. Two 12-inch 348 pound or 158 kilogram lead balls were located near the smaller balls about nine inches away. This is a close-up of two of the four balls. They were held in place with a separate suspension system. The experiment measured the faint gravitational attraction between the small balls and the larger ones. The two large balls were positioned on alternate sides of the horizontal wooden arm of the balance. The mutual attraction to the small balls was ca caused the arm to rotate, twisting the wire supporting the arm. The arm stopped rotating when it reached an angle where the twisting force of the wire balanced the combined gravitational force of attraction between the large and small lead spheres. By measuring the angle of the rod and knowing the twisting force or torque of the wire for a given angle, Cavendish determined the force between the pairs of masses. Since the gravitational force of the Earth on the small ball could be measured directly by weighing it, the ratio of the two forces allowed the density of the Earth to be calculated using Newton's law of gravitation. The formulation of a gravitational constant did not become standard <clears throat> until long after Cavendish's time. One of the first references to G is in 1873, 75 years after Cavendish's work. Cavendish expressed his result in terms of the density of the Earth. He referred to his experiment in correspondence as weighing the world. Later authors reformulated his results in modern terms. Cavendish's value for the Earth's density is 5.448 grams centimeter uh, cube. That gives a value of G equal to 6.74 times 10 to the minus 11th meters cubed over kilograms uh, second squared, which differs by only 1% from the currently accepted value of 6.67428 times 10 to the minus 11th. Some historians of science have argued that Cavendish did not measure the gravitational constant. Physicists, however, generally do credit Cavendish with the first measurement of the gravitational constant. I've talked about the law of falling bodies in part 13. It was something Galileo observed. Newton, with his force equations, was able to prove it. Let's say M1 is the Earth and M2 is the mass of a ball falling towards Earth. In the law of falling bodies, Galileo determined that the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth, of the Earth was little g equals 9.81 meters per second squared. Here's the force of gravity based on Newton's gravitational equation. Here's the equation that characterizes Newton's second law. In this specific instance, the force acting on the ball would be the mass of the ball times the gravitational acceleration g. I have two equations for the force of gravity. I thus have this equality. Notice there's an m sub 2 on both sides of this equation. I can eliminate m sub 2 or m2 from both sides of the equation. Now notice that the force of gravity is independent of the mass of the ball, m2. Galileo, in developing his law of falling bodies, found that all bodies fell with the same constant acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. Oddly, gravity has the same effect on all objects regardless of their mass. That wasn't the case for forces applied to objects. If you're applying a force to an object, the heavier they are, the more force has to be applied to move them at the same velocity. That's what F equals MA tells us. It requires more force to accelerate a larger mass. Gravity somehow didn't seem to work that way. This only works in a vacuum which Galileo wasn't able to create. Some kinds of lighter objects tend to experience more air resistance and so they'll fall more slowly. In a vacuum, however, objects, no matter what their mass, fall at the same rate. Galileo conceived a thought experiment to prove this. Take a feather and an anvil and tie them together with a string. Now drop them and assume this is all in a vacuum. If heavier objects fall faster, then the heavy, heavy anvil will fall faster than the light feather. When tied with a string, the heavy anvil will pull down on the feather. The feather is lighter, and so conceivably, it would fall slower. Because it's on the other end of the string, it's going to pull upward on the anvil. The anvil speeds up the feather, and the feather slows down the anvil. The net effect would be that the whole apparatus falls slower. Now take the feather, string, and anvil together and imagine they're in a box that adds no additional weight. The weight of all three taken together is greater than each of them taken separately, which means that all three 
together should fall at a faster rate. This is a contradiction. Galler concluded that all objects, regardless of their mass, fall at the same rate, and I just proved this algebraically. Notice there's no m2 term in this acceleration equation. The acceleration due to gravity is independent of the mass of the object. Strictly speaking, 9.81 meters per second squared is the mean acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth. Newton's equation includes an r squared in the denominator. 9.81 meters per second squared is acceleration when r equals the mean radius of the Earth, which is 6,371 kilometers. Here's a better way to express this equation for little g. Here's the gravitational constant, and here's the mass of the Earth, and here's the mean radius of the Earth. If you substitute all the quantities, you get this. If you calculate this, it comes out to 9.826 meters per second squared. The acceleration caused by gravity at the surface of the Earth varies because Earth's not a perfect sphere, and so the radius varies. Sometimes you'll see 9.81, and sometimes you'll see 9.82. In this formulation, I knew the mass of the Earth. What if I knew the acceleration, which is easy to quantify, and wanted to know the mass of the Earth? I can solve for the mass of the Earth in this equation. The mass of the Earth is the Earth radius squared times the acceleration due to gravity divided by the gravitational constant g. And that's what Cavendish was trying to determine. His derivation of the gravitational constant g was a byproduct. Here are the values again. These calculations come out to 5.92625 times 10 to the 24th. Not the same as the mass chosen above. Often, it's easier to know acceleration and then from that, derive mass. Here's a demonstration by astronaut David R. Scott, who was on the Apollo 15 mission. On the surface of the moon, he was in a vacuum. Here he drops a hammer and a feather, and they both fall at the same rate, proving Galileo's theory. If the acceleration is identical, how do we reconcile a heavier object dropping at the same rate as a lighter object? Look carefully at this equation. The force is proportional to the mass. The force on the feather is g times the mass of the feather. The force on the anvil is equal to g times the mass of the anvil. The speeds are identical because the net forces are different. The forces are proportional to the masses of the object. Using Newton's equation, the force on the feather is big G times the mass of the feather times the mass of the earth over R squared. Likewise, the force on the anvil is big G times the mass of the anvil times the mass of the earth over R squared. With gravity, the force is greater on more massive objects and less on less massive objects. This makes intuitive sense. If gravity occurs around a mass, then a more massive object would create more mass, more gravity. There are more bits in the hypothetical apple to interact with bits of earth. The anvil, creates, anvil experiences a greater force of gravity because it's more massive, and because it experiences a greater force, it falls at the same rate as the feather. It's not the forces that are equal, it's the acceleration. These equations tell you that the rate at which both objects fall is identical. This confirms one of Galileo's conclusions in the law of falling bodies, that bodies, bodies fall at the same rate or speed regardless of their masses. Here's a better animation, a better demonstration of that. This is part of a series by Brian Cox. This was done at the Plumbrook Station, a remote test facility for the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Inside the space simulation vacuum chamber, which measures 100 feet in diameter by 122 feet high, it's used to test spacecraft. The first drop was done in an ambient atmosphere. And the second was done in a vacuum, where you can see that the feathers and the bowling ball fall at the same rate. And there's a link to the video at the bottom of the screen. The main takeaways from this part is that force can be quantified as F equals ma, mass times acceleration. Gravitational force can also be quantified as force equals g times m1, m2, 
over r squared, which is the distance between the two center points of each mass. I also talked to you about the inverse square law and how it worked. And then I showed you why Galileo's discovery that objects fall at the same speed um, was true. And I proved that algebraically.